Hello, and welcome back to the Break the Twitch podcast on minimizing distractions and doing more of what matters through minimalism, habits, and creativity. I'm your host, Anthony Ungaro. In this episode, I visit my good friend Joshua Becker, the founder of Becoming Minimalist and the Wall Street Journal bestselling author of The Minimalist Home and The More of Less. Joshua and I delve into why it can be so easy to accumulate things and hard to let them go. We discuss how minimalism can help us be more creative, clarify what's important, and better align with our values. Whether you're interested in learning more about a practical, step-by-step approach to decluttering your home, or the power of asking how you can help others, you'll find this conversation to be a great listen on living more intentionally. Our goal with this podcast is to share diverse perspectives about people in progress all humans on their own paths to living intentionally in ways unique to them. Each episode requires dozens of hours of scheduling, filming, editing, producing, and publishing. In the spirit of Break the Twitch, we want to bring you these episodes without the influence of advertisements, sponsors, or brand partnerships. That means that we depend on you, our wonderful listener, to make these continued conversations possible. To do that, we created the member community, a simple monthly membership with tons of benefits, like monthly courses on things like decluttering, mindfulness, and building confidence. There's even a community forum where we gather online. Here's what a current community member, Diana, had to say about the courses. I really like these audio series because they're short, They're easy to digest, and I find myself thinking about particular episodes days later because it resonated with me. I don't write every day, but they make great journal prompts when I do. If you're enjoying this podcast, you can visit breakthetwitch.com slash community to join. For those of you listening that are already in the member community, thank you for making this conversation possible. So let's start the show. podcast. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you for having me, I should say, because this is actually the first episode of the Break the Twitch podcast done on the road. Get out. Yes. I'm breaking new ground for you. <laughs> breaking new ground for the podcast. Well, I hope it turns out good. <laughs> me too. <laughs> me too. To kind of kick things off, you are well known in the minimalism space, and we're going to dig into a bunch of different things over the course of the podcast, but In terms of what you're doing very publicly right now, at least one of the big things you're doing, uh, how did you find minimalism to be a thing that you wanted to pursue? How did that come about? Minimalism was a word that I, I guess I associated with art and architecture and music. So I had heard the phrase, uh, but I'd never thought about how it would apply to life um, necessarily. I was just... I think living a pretty typical middle-class suburban lifestyle, uh, pay increases meant a bigger house and more stuff. And so I was living, living that life. Anyway, um, it was a Saturday morning. Uh, I was cleaning out my garage of all things. Um, we were doing some spring cleaning around our house up in Vermont. Uh, my son was five years old at the time. I had uh, pulled everything out of the garage to tidy it up. Uh, he was in the backyard playing wiffle ball, asking me to come play catch, and I just kept pushing him off. Uh, one more minute, one more minute, right? Like, I'm almost done, I'm almost done, we'll play when I'm done. Hours later, I'm still working on the garage. Uh, my neighbor has been doing all of her yard work. I started complaining to her a little bit about the situation, how just, you know, all this stuff meant all this time I had to take care of it, and she's the one to ever use the She's the first one to ever use the word minimalism uh, for me in that context. And she said, you know, that's why my daughter's a minimalist. She keeps telling me I don't need to own all this stuff. And uh, yeah, I looked at the pile of things in my driveway and out of the corner of my eye, saw my son swinging alone on the swing set in the backyard and suddenly had this realization. Everything I owned wasn't making me happy, but even worse, 
everything I owned was taking me away from the very thing that did bring me happiness and purpose, fulfillment in life. So literally changed everything in like a 30 second conversation. Unbelievable. Just like that. Just like that. How long did it take you to go from that realization to acting on it? And what was the process for you? Did you just get rid of everything? Was it fast? Was it slow? Is it still evolving? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, is a process that started right away. Uh, that evening, I started cleaning out some stuff. I don't remember doing a lot from the garage. I think most things went back into the garage. But when I pulled my car back into the garage, I was like, what is all this? Maps and CDs and books and receipts and coins. Like, what is all this junk doing in my car? So um, got rid of that. But the, um, and, and I think a couple days later, I was going through the living room and then the, the bedrooms. Um, but it took about nine months, I usually say, for us to... Actually, there's three different time frames I give people. Mm. It took about three to four months to go through our lived-in area of the home. So kitchen, bedroom, uh, office, dining room, all those like toy room, like those lived-in spaces, three to four months. Uh, another, but a nine or 10 months total when you start counting like garages, the garage and the basement, like some of those things that we weren't living in, but just took a lot of time to go through. And then Anthony, we moved about three and a half years later into a smaller house and got rid of even more things when we moved into the smaller house that we probably could have gotten rid of the first time, but, but didn't. So How's that? Three answers to your one question? Doesn't yeah, take forever. Great. It's great. It's a, <laughs> you only have to ask like two or three questions. You know? This is long, long form content. It's the purpose of that. I think everyone becomes a temporary minimalist when they move or everyone at least wishes they were when stuff becomes literally physical pain to have to move. Everyone wishes they had yeah. done a lot of this already. We have a big move coming up ourselves, and we're seeing that a lot of the work we've done, a lot because of your initial influence, has been super helpful in creating these opportunities and, and this flexibility that we did not expect to have. Moving is expensive, yeah. and making all these changes costs money whether you have a lot of stuff or not. Yeah. And and so that's been really interesting, seeing the that moving is a big catalyst for a lot of people I know. But it seems like there's a huge opportunity to get there before one of those major life changes happen yeah, and make it easier yeah. once you get there. Yeah. Um, it, we don't usually notice how much stuff we have until we try to put it all in boxes. And then you're like, man, what? That, just more and more, how many boxes do I need to get through all this stuff? There's a, there's a commercial that airs here in the Phoenix area. And um, they've always said this statistic, the study, the, the, the phrase, the fact, but I've never gone back and looked to see where they pull it from, which I intend to do. But uh, the commercial is for a moving company, and they say that moving is the third hardest thing that a person will have to do during their life. I was like, huh, I wonder if that's true. Like, what are the other two that are that are on this list? Um, but then they go into this whole phrase about let us help you, you know, let's make it easier. Sure. And every time I hear the commercial, I'm like, I wonder if that's true, where they get it from. But number two, like, it doesn't have to be that way. Like, when we moved from Vermont here to Phoenix, like it was much easier than I thought it was going to be. There was still hard. You're always changing and transitioning, but just the amount of stuff that we accumulate and keep oftentimes just because we have space for it or we get used to having it around and we don't ever just take a harder look at this is really helping me. Is this really benefiting my life? Uh, or has it just become a, a drain on my resources far more than I realize? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of the time when stuff I find is tucked away, it's in the closet, it's not that painful. And, and it's just, it's hidden. It's not really a part of the day-to-day -day kind of stuff. And for me, that was a big part of the decluttering process, actually, was taking that stuff out actually caused a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. it, it was not 
processing it and getting through it it was like a darkness before the dawn kind of situation yeah, sure. mm -hmm. yeah it was it was interesting but it was worth it obviously yeah yeah and it uh, so like a couple thoughts on that number one like um like in in the book the minimalist home um whenever i help people like implement some of these things i always start in these i always start in the lived in spaces because there is a small reality that when it's out of sight and it's not an item isn't like in our line of vision and isn't in our envi environment, immediate environment. It there's a little less of a distraction, a little less of a stress, a little less of a weight. It's not fully gone because we still know it's there, right? Like it's still in the back of our mind. Oh man, there's all that stuff in the basement, and I have to go through it at some point. You know, there's all that stuff in the garage, and I have to go through it at some point. It's like this project that we always put off forever into the future. So there is some extra burden that that is associated with it, but it's not quite as immediately felt as in the spaces that, that we that we live in. Um, and then I find the same thing for me, same thing for most people. Like this process does bring up a lot of questions and internal searching and um, it's as much about getting rid of outward possessions as it is journeying inward, I think. Like, why did I accumulate all this stuff? Uh, why did I buy it all in the first place? What was motivating me? Was it healthy or unhealthy? And then what does this represent? You know, is this a positive season of my life or a negative season of my life? And I think just the question of why is this hard for me to get rid of? Um, why is it hard for me to get rid of books? Why is it hard for me to get rid of things from my... Uh, childhood or my child's childhood, even though I'm not in that phase of life anymore and don't need that, uh, why is it hard for me to part with it? I think all those questions are good, but a lot of people are afraid of them and tend to tend to stop when they start getting a little more difficult. But gosh, I think that's where some of the greatest breakthroughs and um, things that we learn about ourselves are just like we're just on the cusp of some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. What would you say is some of your personal belief around why it's so hard? Oh, gosh. Um, it looks uh, very different from person to person. <clears throat> um, but I, I think that there are some pretty consistent human attributes. Like, I think there's some pretty consistent things that you find in, in the human heart that, that tend to lead to that. Uh, I'd, I'd never discount external factors, um, advertising and marketing and the culture that we live in and what gets praised in our society. Like there are all of those external factors, um, but no, like no marketers driving you to the store to, to take something to the register. No advertisement is actually, you know, clicking to ship on, on Amazon. It's us making those decisions. Um, so in terms of overaccumulation in the first place, I like I, I think you run into uh, jealousy and greed and envy and selfishness and this desire to impress other people and prove that we're successful, um, trying to measure up to certain expectations. I, I think all those things are kind of hardwired into um, most of us, if not all of us. And so some of those external factors tend to, I think, speak to some of those unhealthy motivations, which cause then the overaccumulation in the first place. Uh, and then, you know, there's a whole, this whole other set of conversation of, you know, what makes it hard to, hard for some people to, to get rid of, um, get rid of certain things. Mm -hmm. There's a, a piece where we, uh, I, I think our possessions tend to be a part of our identity um, too often. Like this tends to be, who we are, like I'm the person who has a lot of cool fashion and that's just who I am and it's a part of the, the image that I portray to the world or I, you know, I drive nice cars, um, I'm really successful. Uh, there's a, a lot tied to this fantasy self version, which is what a, a, a phrase that Francine J, Francine J coined. Mm -hmm. Um, we tend to wish that we were someone who did a lot of camping or did a lot of reading um, did a lot of woodworking. Actually, Dave Bruno um, used the phrase death of a dream uh, when he got rid of his woodworking tools that he wasn't using. He said, I just kind of realized that I've always wanted to be a woodworker, but I'm just not. 
Um, and getting rid of some of that fantasy version of yourself allows us to walk more fully in the person that we are. And then one more, um, and then I'll let you talk. <laughs> no. um, uh, one more that I see uh, and I talk a lot about is um, past seasons of life, uh, especially when people get older and, and they're downsizing, or e- like any stage of life, really. Like we go back to, I loved that season of life where I was a young mother, or I love that season of life where I was, I don't know, um, a banker, you know, as opposed to what I'm doing. Like, I loved that season where I was a marathon runner. And getting rid of those things can be very difficult for people um, because they wish they were back in that previous season of life. But I think when you say goodbye to those things, you free yourself up to walk more fully in the season that you are. You see this a lot with like a spouse who passes away um, and getting rid of some of those things um, can be difficult for someone. I, I don't think it's dishonoring that person or that relationship to to get rid of some of those possessions. I, I think for the most part, they want you to walk fully. Like you honor that relationship most by walking fully uh, into tomorrow. I'm going to, to butcher this saying, but... I think it's a Taoist phrase of I must let go of who I was to become who I will be. Mm. And what you're saying to me resonates with that mentality. And and for me, that was a big part of this too. In fact, my very first video I ever did on YouTube was me sitting down and talking about how we choose to imbue ourselves with the identity of the things that we own Hmm. being a bmw guy or being in a social circle that all kind of revolves around a look a brand image associations and it's interesting because one of the lines i've been trying to walk and figure out is the idea that people do judge on first impression and there's so much talk. I was reading a Neil Patel, he's you know this big marketing guy, really su- successful in mm-hmm. that scope. I was reading an article from him saying that he spent $116,000 on clothes and it made him $800,000. And he went in and bought a $2,000 hoodie that he was going to wear with gym shorts to go running in. And he happened to meet some other people that were also shopping in that store did a bunch of business deals with them because they made some associations. And societally, I think this is something we can't really control. Mm -hmm. I do believe we all need to do our best to address the prejudices that we hold. In fact, I've even caught myself making snap judgments about people that I might see and then thinking, on what basis am I making this assumption Mm -hmm. and trying to be conscious of that? Mm -hmm. Around walking that line of making a good first impression based on our societal expectations Mm -hmm. and knowing deep within that I am who I am, it doesn't matter what I'm wearing. Mm -hmm. It's a tough line to walk. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the question is there, (laughs) but it's just something I've been thinking about a lot. Yeah. Uh, I did a... um... I was on a podcast one time with uh, uh, Chuck Woolery, actually, and um, uh, him and a co-host. And the co-host was like a, a marketing advertising guy, and he uh, he wanted to challenge me on on some of these things because he's like in advertising, you know. And uh, he's like, "Look, if I I can't walk into a client meeting and be wearing like a super cheap suit and." be driving this 20 year old car into this meeting because I have to convince these people that I do what I do very well. And, um, you know, like I'm good at what I do. Like that's part of the the package that I'm trying to sell. And, um, and I said, well, okay, first of all, minimalism doesn't mean that you have to own really cheap things. Like, own a really nice watch, own a really nice suit. If you need them in those types of environments, you don't need five or six really nice watches. You don't need uh, 30 or 40 really nice suits. If I mean, there's only five days in a work week anyway, you know? So, so there is a piece where like this looks different from person to person on who you are and, and what you want to do well um, and, and how you want to portray yourself a little bit to the world. So so I would say that first and foremost. 
However, on a deeper level, I would say this, and I don't know Neil necessarily at all. So, and I, I'm not saying this would be the, the, but in relation to your illustration, I would look at my life and I would say, okay, who, like, what kind of person do I want to be around? Who do I want to attract into my life? What are the kind of people that I'm trying to impress that I, I want to be good friends with? Because I don't think I want a, a set of friends who care about how expensive my hoodie is or what suit I wear or even the work that I do. I don't want people who need that image um, because in the long run, I'm not going to enjoy working with that person in the long run anyway. Like I want to be around people who are impressed by generosity and contentment and some of these things, these values that are most important to me. I want people who are impressed by that, uh, not the car that I drive or the hoodie that I run in. So uh, that's kind of how I try to walk that line. So discovering minimalism, having that come into your life and taking action on that learning obviously had a massive shift in how you lived your life. Was there another thing like that earlier in your life in a different way that had a similar influence in terms of the direction of your life? If I were to think of significant life events, uh, there's no like life event related to like my, my parents other than all that they taught me and the life that they modeled and the worldview that they, they taught me. Um, like that's a huge factor, but probably not what you meant. Um, I, uh, my religious faith, I'm, um, Christian and, uh, it was in high school where, um, like the Bible started making sense to me and who Jesus was and what he offered and what he was calling us to. And, and that, that view of the world, um, that made sense to me, that would probably be, the most significant uh, worldview shaping moment. Uh, and then minimalism then like just fits in perfect with, I, I think that whole worldview of everything that Jesus taught about, you know, money and possessions and that there's more important things in the world like love and faith and hope and peace. So um, it, and actually I was a pastor for 15 years, so that's how significant, um, how significant that moment was of uh, uh, accepting Christ into my life. Um, and then I s still follow him today, but just not as a uh, pastor. So you mentioned your parents. Were there any other influences that were very important to you in that way? Yes. Uh, my grandfather, uh, he's, uh, he's 98 and he's a full-time pastor still. So um, he's certainly been a significant shaping force in my life. Uh, when I was in college, um, I lived with a family, uh, Jack and Linda Arendt. I was in Omaha, uh, finished high school in Omaha, my first year of college at University of Nebraska, Omaha. My parents moved to South Dakota, back to South Dakota. UNO didn't have any dorms at the time, and so I lived with this family, um, the Arents, and I lived there for five years. I lived there with them until I got married. And um, so they, yeah, they had a significant influence uh, on my life for sure. Did you grow up going to the church where your grandfather was a pastor? We were in South Dakota until sixth grade. Okay. Uh, we were in Aberdeen, so uh, I went to church at his church till sixth grade. Then we moved to North Dakota um, for five years, and then we moved to Omaha. So, And I haven't been back to Aberdeen. My whole family's there now, my brother and sister and parents, so they all uh, still go to that church. But now I'm in Phoenix. <laughs> now you're in Phoenix. Warmer. A smidge warmer. A smidge, smidge warmer. warmer. I'm wondering for, for you, you have these values that you were brought up with. You have, it seems like you had this model of, from your parents, from your grandfather. Um, how does it all tie together? How did it help you tie it all together with, with this, the last 10 years of finding minimalism, pursuing it, and now talking about it? What minimalism did... And this uh, was kind of even came out in, in the writing of, of The Minimalist Home as I was thinking about it. Um, what I discovered was that minimalism didn't change 
any of my values. I, I have seen minimalism change people's values and what's important to them and, and what they're uh, intentionally pursuing with their life, like, like really shake them down to the core um, and, and change even everything that they thought about life. For me, minimalism didn't do that. But what it did do was it aligned my life more around those things than I had ever thought possible. Um, so like my faith has always been important to me. But when I was like accumulating a bunch of stuff and, and buying a lot of stuff and flipping through the Sunday ads, you know, with the Sunday paper and seeing what's on si- sale at Best Buy, like when you spend your energy pursuing those things, it, it gets in the way of the, you know, pursuing your faith. And my family was always important to me. But clearly, like that whole picture of me cleaning out the garage, it was like, wait, my family is among the most important things to me. And I'm giving up a day with them to clean like rakes and shovels and like all this stuff that I didn't need. And then I started looking at like, how much of my life have I wasted? Um, and how much of my money have I wasted pursuing some of those things? So faith has always been important to me. Minimalism allowed me to, I think, go places I never thought I would with faith and family. And then a third one has always been, like I've always wanted to make an impact in the world and I've always wanted to make a difference and and be significant. And I hope uh, some of that is motivated for healthy reasons. Like, I, like I'm sure there's some unhealthy motivations in there as well, if I was just being honest with myself. But for the most part, it's because I've, I've had people speak into my life and change it for the better. And I want to speak into other people's lives and, uh, and help as many people as I possibly can. And then again, minimalism allowed me to do more of that than I ever thought I could have before. So that's how values and minimalism and intentionality just all comes together. Like that was the light bulb moment. It was like my possessions are distracting me from my values. Um, I mean, my possessions are distracting me from my values and minimalism is a way for me to, to promote them even more and pursue them even more. Yeah, it makes a ton of sense to me. For me, I think I would be actually a person that held the values, but the process of decluttering understanding minimalism better, learning about it, helped me clarify a lot of them. And I'm still not perfect. In fact, the idea of the twitch for me is this idea that I'm probably just allowing myself to get stronger in understanding how my brain works in what it wants in the moment versus what I know is more aligned with my values and finding ways to do that. I don't know that it's it's gotten easier to deal with for me. It's gotten easier to not buy stuff that that I don't need. It's gotten easier to keep a more minimalist home, if mm-hmm. you will. Mm-hmm. And it's helped me clarify the values that I hold and realize that these are really, really important things. Mm-hmm. For me, for a very long time, it was very easy to just kind of just coast. It's like the, I think of a glider kind of picking up a thermal and then, you know, kind of coming down and those little phone checks, the busyness, the buying, they just kind of were helping me float from one thing to the next and be okay. Mm -hmm. And increasingly I'm just slowly still through process learning to prioritize the right kinds of things that I know will give me the longest value, give the world the longest value. When I say give me the longest value, I just mean allow me to do the things that will let me show up Mm -hmm. uh, in the world in the ways that I really want to. And so it's interesting. Do you think it, it ever goes away fully? Has it gone away for you? Is it so defined at this point that this is such a clear, obvious thing that do you have the temptation to buy stuff that you're like, wait a minute, I don't need that. Does that still happen? Yeah, sure. Um, still happens. Um, I think it happens a lot less than it did before. Um, well, a ton less than it did before. Uh, and I, I think I'm a little more in tune to it when, when it does pop up. Um, 
It helps that I write about minimalism all the time. Um, I mean, it helps that I've been writing about this for 10 in a year, 10 years and, uh, in, uh, you know, involved in a community of people that are, you know, trying to live this out. Um, that tends to be very helpful. No, I, uh, I don't think it ever, uh, I don't think it ever really changes. Um, two thoughts come to mind. Um, there's a book called the tyranny of the urgent and I forget the, the author's name, but, um, the, you know, the whole basis of the book is that the most important things in life usually get pushed off to the side because of the, the urgent things that pop up, right? The emails, the, the phone calls, um, that we tend to focus on those things rather than um, focusing on the things that are most important. And then uh, um, Charlie Gilkey, um, he was the first one who I ever heard use this phrase, um, but he said that oftentimes your, well, almost always, your most important work is usually the hardest work um, to do. Um, and if it's hard for you to do, and if it's important, then it's, you know, like it's the thing that you're supposed to be doing, but usually all the other things pop up that are, that are easier to do and, and tend to grab our attention and our time and, and our focus. Um, so I think keeping our, our minds on that, right? Like, like these values are what's most important. This is what I want to accomplish with my life. This is what I want to be. And knowing that it's not something that you just decide one time to do, but it's, it's a daily it's a mm-hmm. daily decision, right? Like marriage, I suppose, is the perfect illustration. Like there was a day where I got married to my wife, but it's still a commitment that I make every single morning, you know, that I'm going to be faithful to her and I'm, I'm going to love her. And uh, again, like we know what our values are and we've decided upon them, but still every single day, uh, like we return to, you know, this is what I want to do. This is what's important to me. Um, I need to focus time and energy there. That's just so true. <laughs> the The marriage is the beginning. <laughs> yeah, the wedding. The wedding is the, the wedding beginning. is yeah. the beginning. <laughs> With all this stuff, it's the working outside of things. Fitness, physical fitness, has been something I've been very focused on over the last year and a few months, and it just has smacked me in the face that the moment you stop doing it it goes away. It's, mm-hmm. you got to pay that rent every, every week, every month, whatever, you know, you got to keep going. Mm-hmm. I'd always go through these bouts six months at a time of eating perfectly macros, meal planning, hour and a half gym sessions of, of lifting and cardio, lose a bunch of weight, get really lean. Inevitably something would happen and I'd stop and I'd go over the next six months to a year, just go right back to where I was. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's just hitting me so much more now that I need to slow down, realize this is it, that each day is what it is. And the moment we stop showing up for the people in our lives, lifting, whatever, we're no longer living in those values. And I think that's one of the things that drives for people, maybe for me, the, the attachment to the, the identity of the stuff. Because once you let go of the, the high school wrestling trophy, you don't get to rest on that anymore. You don't get to still have that be of who you are today. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's part of why it's so difficult. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I, I, I found that very early on that I... Um, actually, I, I got rid of a bunch of books in my office um, so I was pastoring at the time, a uh, youth pastor, and I had three bookshelves full of books and cut it down to one and a half. And um, I remember like shortly thereafter, uh, I came upon a problem or there was something that popped up and I remember spinning in my chair to grab the book that I would have grabbed to, to try to read what it was or to, to look for the quick solution for it. And the book wasn't there anymore. And I remember like turning back to, to my desk and thinking, okay, well, that book is gone. Now, how am I going to solve this problem? Like, how am I going to look forward to solve it? Because clearly turning to that book hadn't solved the problem in the past, 
But because it wasn't there anymore, I was forced to say, okay, what is the new solution that I'm going to find to this problem? And I, I wrote a blog post not long after, like one of the benefits of minimalism is that I felt no longer tied to my past, that I felt free to walk forward into the, into the future and um, find solutions to problems and map out a whole new pathway forward. Like I felt more open to do that in that moment than I had ever, ever felt before. Alex Piglieri, a, a past guest on the podcast is a designer, he's an industrial designer. And he spent a lot of time talking about designing within limitations and the power of having limited resources and designing a solution for that mm-hmm. problem. And it got me thinking a lot about minimalism and about having less and being forced to be creative and exercising our brains to come up with solutions to different things that maybe that book isn't there anymore. Okay. What's an interesting, what's a way I can solve this problem without buying the exact specific, this is a camera thing, big film industry thing. Like there's an exact specific solution for everything and it costs a lot of money and you can buy it anywhere. Mm -hmm. And there's probably a million different ways to tape something to a broom to get the pole to work. And you have to be a little creative and scrappy and make it work. And to me, this feels like an analogy for so much of what's possible when we start applying ourselves in this way by not feeling the need to buy the specific thing. Because I would always want to buy the, oh, this is the exact thing that this is for and it has one use. This Mm -hmm. is an avocado slicer. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I don't even know where I was going with that, no, but, no, <laughs> but it's... That's, those are important. Those are important. Uh, Dave Bruno, uh, in his book, The 100 Thing Challenge, um, he, like, he makes the same point. Um, it, the 100 Thing Challenge, and then his um, subtitle is Reduce, Reuse, Rejigger. And, uh, and, and he says the exact same thing, that as he got down to owning just 100 items, um, reducing it and, and reusing that he found that he was far more creative than he ever thought that, uh, that there are, there's more than one way to solve a problem. And because he had just 100 things, there are a lot of things where he would normally reach for that exact tool to do it. And he said, I was, I was shocked at how many things I could do in the kitchen with a spoon and a knife, you know, yeah. <laughs> and a cutting board as opposed to the avocado slicer. I always thought that would make a funny YouTube video of having a competition between I, I buy all the single use things, the banana slicer, the avocado slicer, the watermelon punch thing, yeah. and then have just a knife and then have two people going head to head to see really how much longer it took or how much better each of these individual use things was. Yeah. Again. Cause it, it can't, I see how, but yeah. Right. Plus you get to buy a whole bunch of single use things. And that's, that would, that's why I haven't done it yet. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I haven't done it yet because I, I don't know that we want to have a drawer full of that stuff yeah. at this point. <laughs> oh, geez. So actually Haley from the Break the Twitch member community had a specific question to ask that is oh, coming sweet. up to me right now. She was asking about when you started sharing your journey with this stuff, which we'll dig into the, the, creativity side and the the habits of what you're doing. But when you started sharing this stuff about decluttering, about changing your lifestyle, did you meet resistance? And if so, what kind of resistance and from whom? Honestly, almost none really. And I, I know that not everyone has that experience. Like some people get resistance from like the person they love the most and live with. Right. Like, um, but I, I didn't, and, and other people from friends or parents, um, whatever it might be, I, uh, I, I never did. I, I, I ran inside for my conversation with my neighbor and my wife had been spring cleaning the inside of the house all day. And so as soon as I said, we should get rid of some stuff, she's like, I'm in like, let's, it's let's do it. Um, I find, and, and I, so and then I'll, I'll go speak about it and, and like how many people argue with you and, and challenge you on this. And I, I say like very few, like maybe on one hand, I can count the number of people who told me that I'm, I'm wrong about this. Usually when you explain and lay out 
why you're doing what you're doing and what you're hoping to accomplish with it, um, that most people can see it. Like there might be a snap judgment and reaction. And actually, like, I'll even say this to walk back everything I just said. Like when I called my mom that night and I said, hey, I think we're going to become minimalist. She's like, oh, dear, I don't I don't think you know what you're getting yourself into. Um, and I said, no, I don't know what you think about it. Like, this is what we're doing and this is why we're doing it. And she's like, oh, okay, yeah, sure. I can see how that would be beneficial to you. So, so I think there's some snap judgments that people make about minimalism or what they think it means, or, um, uh, maybe some people, you know, um, feel challenged in their own life because of, you know, what you're, what you're pursuing, but I, I, you know, I don't think it has to be presented in, in any judgmental way. And, um, so, uh, sometimes I have some entrepreneurs that tell me I'm, you know, going to ruin the economy and, uh, that this is a big mistake. Um, that was one, one entrepreneur came up to me afterwards to talk and he was like the only person ever to be like, be careful what you're doing because this is how people make money and, you know, crash the whole economy. And I'm like, ah, I don't think that's necessarily the case. So did you meet yeah. very much resistance, Anthony? There was definitely some misunderstanding. Yeah. Or misunderstanding, just a lack of understanding of why someone would want to go the opposite direction. And I think through I've always had this idea of of wanting to be living proof. And when it comes to what I tell people too about how to convince a partner or how to convince a partner to make a change in their life that's really substantial like this that that can be really impactful is you can't change someone you can't force someone to be ready to to do this kind of thing mm -hmm. but you can step into your existence in the best way that you can be living proof of what's possible for other people and i've done my best to try to exemplify that of what's possible when you can take greater risks because you have less liability. When mm -hmm. you can make some of these changes to, to leverage your life in a way, leveraging your assets, both monetary and not, in a way. I think that's one of the biggest things too that has come from this process is all of a sudden our 1,250 square foot house has a lot of opportunity. It has a studio in it now dedicated mm -hmm. and it has other elements that have made it work for us instead of being this just giant liability that makes it hard to do other things mm -hmm. and so the, the careful selection of these things and, and just trying to be living proof of of what is possible with these changes i think is really important yeah yeah maybe even more important than you know did you get much resistance to it is how do you how do you handle that resistance um what do you do when you know people are making fun of you or they don't understand what you're doing or they insult you for for what you're doing um and i i, I just think that when you're when you're confident about why you're doing it and and you just return to no this is why this is important for me and um this is why i'm making these decisions that when when someone does try to resist you, you know, or does try to talk you out of it. Um, there's a, for me, it's just always been a sense of, no, I don't think you quite picture what I'm, what I'm trying to do here. You know, like there's always something off that they misunderstand, um, about whatever it is that, mm -hmm. about the change that I'm trying to make. So mm -hmm. I would encourage Haley in that way, if she's getting any resistance. At this point, you've been writing about minimalism now, making YouTube videos, writing books. Your most recent book just came out, Minimalist Home, The Minimalist Home. What are some of the practices and the habits that show up in your life in a way that allow you to stay consistent, share your work, do what matters to you? Man, over 10 years, I have had a lot of different writing habits um, and producing habits. Uh, at first, uh, I, I started the blog that weekend that I was introduced to minimalism. And I don't, 
I, I don't think there was anyone writing specifically about minimalism back then. I mean, there were people writing about minimalism, but it's usually in a different, like a larger context. Um, I, I don't know of any other blog websites that have the word minimalism or minimalist in it. Um, so I like to think I started the trend. But anyway, um, I at, at the beginning then, like when there were no readers, like it was just me. Like I was, it was, it was a journal. It was a diary. Uh, I was writing about things that I was learning. Um, I felt no pressure to write something that other people were going to read. Sometimes I had like a sentence long blog post. Sometimes it was a link to an article. Like I was just anything that I noticed or was intriguing to me, um, a, a revelation or inspiration. What I did, like I was just sometimes two or three times a day, like very short blog posts that I was putting out. So that was like the beginning of the the writing habit for me. Anytime I had a thought, I, I was putting it into a blog post. <laughs> um, then about a uh, year and a half into it, uh, when I wrote a blog post about getting rid of belts, I was like, what am I writing about <laughs> belts for? I've been writing about this for 18 months, and I'm like, I got rid of these two brown belts. Uh, so like, then it became like, there were a few people that had been following along with my story and it became, okay, I would really like to help people do this. Like, how can I play the neighbor's role in, um, in someone else's life? And when I started writing that way, it was, it was very motivating to me because it wasn't just my self journey. It was like, okay, what if I learned what would be helpful to people? And I was uh, uh, writing like three times a week then at that point and anything I'm like, you know what I've learned in my life? I've learned this and I've noticed that, and this is how we did this and how can I put words to it? Um, and so I, I found that to be very, very helpful too. Um, and then I started writing books and it, it became, okay, how do I discipline myself to do this? It became much more of a I'm much better at writing blog posts than than books. I've had some wonderful editors help turn out some really good books. Eric Stanford is his name, and he's genius, and he's been very helpful to me, pushing me in that direction. But it became much more of a, okay, this is when I'm going to sit down during the week, and I'm going to put some stuff down. And um, at different points through my writing journey, I have I have found value in different habits. Um, but almost always when... When the mindset is like, how can I help other people? Like, what can I write that would be beneficial to others? That's for me has always been motivating. And when I feel motivated and or there's a deadline, then that's when I tend to tend to do my best writing. So yeah. these days, what might a typical day look like then? It's very interesting. Um, there's a program out there called Hope Writers and uh, they walk through uh, six stages of the writing journey. Uh, Is that like I, six stages of grief? Kind yeah, of? <laughs> and I and I don't <laughs> remember. I don't remember all of them, but it it starts out about like just writing for yourself, and then uh, you begin building an audience, and and then you um, like make your first dollar writing, and then you are into agent mode, you know, making proposals and stuff, and then you're into like promoting your work. And then they have this sixth stage where it's like um, enterprising, uh, like entrepreneur enterprising type where it's, and now you have a team around you and you have other people doing things to help you with promotion and you're, you know, have kind of this team concept, which is where becoming minimalist has become uh, over the past year, uh, year and a half. And so, um, so I write twice a week. Um, I write on Sunday evenings um, and usually Wednesday or Thursday. Uh, every other week I write three times. So there's also a Friday in there. Um, so I, I still have my set times when, when I write. Um, but I found that I've been in book promotion phase for the past two and a half months. And so I did two radio interviews today and I have another one tomorrow. And so uh, this stage of life, it's been a little bit up in the air, but we published two magazines and I have the Hope Effect nonprofit and we started the YouTube channel. And so is there, there so there's no typical day. Uh, <laughs> I, um, uh, I drop my son off at school at 7.10. Uh, I usually go to the gym until 9.00. 
Uh, my son gets out of soccer at four, um, so I'm usually in the office from nine to four, half hour for lunch. I found that I get more done when I have like that six to seven hour window than when I was trying to work seven to five. Like I get more done in seven hours than when I'm here for 10. So uh, that's one of the things that I've learned about myself. And then on my way home, there's a, a Target and a Kohl's and a Marshall's. So I usually stop at each of those just to check the clearance rack. <laughs> To see, to see it's what like, I to see going? to see what I need that I didn't know I needed until I saw it with a red. Just cross. about every day, you'd say. I would say most days. Okay. Most days, yeah. Most days. So those are always good. It's good. It's a Walmart, but mostly the Marshalls. Mostly. Kohl's. Kohl's usually has a sale. So almost always on sale. <laughs> Plus the Kohl's bucks. Uh, you know, yes, you I usually have Kohl's bucks that I need to. <laughs> you get. I need to use up on the way home. You just mentioned the book promotion mode, and I know that you just had this book come out recently, and it's been incredibly well received. A lot of copies have sold. In fact, it's sold out for the first couple weeks, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. First three printings all sold out. Thank you for letting me mention that. My publisher called me with the idea. Um, I had a different book in mind, and they said, look, The More of Less was great and sold a lot of copies, but I... I think if we like, let's help people do this room by room. How do they implement this in their home? Um, and I, they think they said, I, I think it'll do great. And I said, Yeah, I see a need for it. So let's let's write it. So um, yes, it's been it sold even better than than I thought it would, which is great. That's great, and better than they thought it would as well. Since it kept selling out right the away. Sellouts sold out in four hours on Amazon. Wow, four hours it was sold out of stock. It's incredible. Who is that book for then? Uh, the book is for <clears throat> uh, anyone who wants to own less um, and wants clear steps on how to get there. My neighbor introduced me to minimalism and I got started that day. Like I, I didn't read any books. I read a blog post online, A Guide to Creating a Minimalist Home by Zen Habits, which had mm -hmm. like seven steps and is still the first place I send everybody because it was fantastic. But I wasn't like, I wasn't reading through a book on how to do this. I just, let's do this and let's try this and now let's do this room. And so um, I didn't use a book like this to do it. But I have found that there are a lot of people who do want like just help me, help me think differently about the kitchen and the living room and, and give me a good plan that you've seen work for you and you've seen work for other people. Um, I, I want that in a book. And uh, so that's who the, that's who the book is for. Like if you, if you're already living a minimalist life, then I think the minimalist home would provide some interesting thoughts for you and uh, some new ways to think about certain things. Um, but mostly it's for someone who wants to wants more of this in their life um, and is looking for uh, some steps because each 18 different spaces we go through like from living room and dining room to bedroom bathroom office entryway like uh, mud room Water. laundry room garage shed yard like it it covers every uh, covers every space in a very inspirational way though what was one of your biggest learnings while producing that book my biggest learning was this this will sound weird, that I could actually write that book. Like that was honestly the biggest thing because mm -hmm. they called and asked me to write it. And my first response was, I agree, it would sell really well, but I don't do, here's the first seven, like here's the seven steps you need in your kitchen. And here's the six steps to do in the living room. I, like I've always been much more, inspirational, motivational, um, look at what your life could become. Let's look at how this is detracting from your life. Let's think differently. I've never been, here's the six steps to get through your bathroom closet. Like that just wasn't me. Um, and I didn't think that I could do it. But again, Eric um, Stanford, the editor, and actually I, we listed him as a co-writer. He did you know so much work and, and so much help on it. Like he, like he just pulled so much out of me and he's like, just go, go stand in your bathroom. Like, like, what do you remember doing? What were the steps that you went through? What, if, what are the questions that you've seen other people ask and what advice do you give them? 
uh, and let's just put this in a way that can be uh, on paper and and very helpful. So honestly, the thing that I, I learned most was that I could actually even write the book, um, not just for my own. And I've been doing an, uh, Uncluttered is an online course that I've been doing uh, for several years. 25,000 people have gone through it. And so I relied a lot on yeah, you know what, this is what I keep seeing pop up in this room and in this space. And here's some of the issues that continually arise and the questions that arise. And here's some of the things that I've seen people do that have been helpful. Um, and so honestly, all those, just all those interactions and all those people and all those stories of what, and all the questions have you know, really helped um, write the book in the first place. Hmm. That's good. Uh, that's a good learning. That, that reminds me about goal setting. And, and that kind of process for a long time, probably up until a couple of years ago, actually, I always had this idea. It was like the lottery concept where once you hit a certain level of success, you had made it mm. that you're there, you're a celebrity now, or you have this certain amount of clout and things just get easy for you. Mm -hmm. I haven't found that point yet. <laughs> And from what I'm projecting outwards of when things suddenly click into place, you have a certain number of followers or subscribers or email list folks or a published book. Have you found that there's a place when things start to get easier or do things just get more broad and you get better at handling them? <clears throat> I was doing a podcast years and years ago and um, the Facebook group that I do um, the Becoming Less Facebook group is like 1.3 million people now. And uh, someone said, man, I would be so nervous to post anything that was going to be seen by 1.3 million people. How do you, like, how do you overcome it? And I said, I, I, uh, I don't know, I guess. I guess I don't think of it that way. Like it was 10 people and I was doing something that became 100 and 1,000 and 10,000 and 100,000. And I've just been doing what I was doing that, that grew it to that point. And so I guess I don't think of, oh yeah, 1.3 million people might, you know, see this now. It's just, this is what I'm doing and people seem to like it and it seems to help people and resonate with people. And so I'm just going to keep doing it. And then some of those external measures of success, you know, may or may not be there. Uh, honestly, and look, there's no, like this is easy for me or this is easy for anybody. It's it's not. But I, I've come to the point where it's just like, did I do my best today? Like just did I, did I do what was most important and did I do it to the best of my ability? And if I did that, then that's where I'm going to find contentment and that's where I'm going to find like some measure of, I don't success. Yeah. Success, right? Like if I'm trying to measure by anything else, it, the, the field goal, the marker's always going to, the goal's always going to finish line. It's always going to change, but did I do my best today? And did I do it out of healthy motivations? Then you can sleep well at night. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a big thing with goal setting and with this kind of space, especially in the space of not having clearly outlined goals. And, and a lot of them are arbitrary. Like I have a published book. If that's a goal that requires certain things to, to line up and get there. And once you're there, it doesn't just promote itself. It doesn't, it just, it's a new, bigger, harder challenge in a lot of ways. And I think that perception has been interesting for me, especially being around you, being around other authors as well, just that, that have this book come out and it just feels like it's easy to have a perception of, well, you've made it. It's, you know, you, you have this thing and now everything is just, you just coast books out. You're good to go. But it's like, no, it always, it just seems like the bigger break the Twitch gets, I find the more people that follow the, the more there is to do. We have taken less time off the more we've made mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the more mm -hmm. we produce, it's like, we were just talking about this yesterday. Like, aren't we supposed to have more freedom yeah, <laughs> with this? Right. Mm -hmm. And it's a funny, it's a funny thing, yeah. uh, the perception. And I think I'm speaking just to my own experience of what I thought 
why I thought people entrepreneurshiped yeah. and mm-hmm. why people make some of these choices. It's in, it's interesting. Yeah, I um, so I spoke at uh, FinCon, um, big financial bloggers conference. Actually, all sorts of financial creators, not just bloggers. And um, I spoke on. Uh, I said when the when our filter is. Um, you know, how can I make more money that, that there's never any end to that filter or how many YouTube subscribers can I get or, um, how many podcast downloads or how many copies of this book can I sell? Like when, when that becomes the motivation, then, then there is no end to it because you can always make more money. Um, what I said was the filter should be, how can I help more people? Like, how can I help more people when, and how can I help people better? When that becomes the filter, then there comes a point where, you know what, I can help more people by resting a little bit more this weekend, or maybe I can help more people by writing this book and running Facebook ads that send people to it. Like, this is a way that I can help more people. Um, I I find that it, it tends to limit us a little bit more. Um, I think it tends to be a far more fulfilling pursuit than, you know, some of the other goals. And sometimes when the goal is how can I help more people, it becomes I, I write this book, you know, I, uh, I grow this YouTube channel, I grow this podcast, and I do put in the extra hours to do it because I know it will help uh, more people in the long run. But it reaches a point where, more hours doesn't mean more help, like we already talked about earlier. Yeah. It reminds me of something that you said about work and about okay. vacations, which I found very interesting. And again, it was one of those things, this was years ago now, that caused a sort of shift in thinking. You said this. I'm pretty sure this is word for word what you said. I believe that we should take vacations so that we can work better, not work harder so we can take better vacations. It was very interesting to me hearing that perspective. Mm -hmm. What do you think it was that got you to those words or that perspective? Yeah. Yeah. Easy. It is the perspective that work is fulfilling, that that work is one of the most fulfilling things that we can do with our life and with our time. Um, Not work in sense of, I just want the biggest paycheck that I can possibly get, but work in the sense of, like work should be, and it is, like it should be an act of service. Like like work is love when when you think about it. I do what I'm good at in order to make life better for someone else, whether it's writing books or installing irrigation or picking up trash or teaching kindergarten or being a good accountant or attorney uh, or you know running the cash register at, at the grocery store, like everything we do should be for the sake of, right? Like making life better for someone else. Work is very fulfilling in that way. Um, it's not it's not a four letter word. I'm, I'm not a big fan of retirement. Like I'm not a big fan of, I'm just going to work until I make, make enough money to never have to work again. Like that doesn't sound appealing to me. I, um, I find joy in work and purpose in work and I can't imagine my life without it. And so, um, in that sense, then work isn't like vacation, isn't the dream work. Vacation isn't the goal. Um, uh, work, doing good work and helping people and, and serving others. That's, that's the dream. And certainly, a, you know, a, a week skiing with a bunch of guys in Denver helps me do better work when, when I get back. So, um, that was, that would have been the context of that conversation. Yes. That was the context of that conversation. Mm-hmm. I've had jobs that I did not like, but there were moments of that in it. When I was in customer service at a department store at Von Mar for, in college, I did my best to take pride in the work that I was doing. I loved doing the gift wrap and I loved wrapping it to the best that I could. I took pride in that thing. 
And it was annoying, I think, to someone. People would come up with a box and say, okay, can you gift wrap this? But there's a certain element of flow, of challenge, of speed. And I think what you're, what you're speaking of, it, it reminds me a lot of flow. And, and Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi who talks about the pride in work and process and doing it well and, and serving through the way that we work. Mm-hmm. And it's just an interesting shift. I think it can change so much from within uh, when you employ that mentality. Mm-hmm. It really does, because it's kind of that whole positive thinking shift around what we're actually showing up to do. Yeah. Yeah. And there, I mean, there are times when work isn't the right fit. I mean, there's times when we're doing things that we're not gifted to do or we're not passionate to do, or sometimes the people around us make make work unenjoyable. Um, Also, on the flip side, I don't, there aren't any 100% perfect jobs. Like there's always... Rowan, you know, thorns and thistles and uh, like any job, you know, there's some things that we don't like about it either. So there certainly is walking this line. Um, But I'm, you know, I'm pretty convinced that, like you said, like even in a situation where you you don't enjoy the job that you're doing, um, sometimes it just takes a little perspective shift of, okay, I don't really like what I'm doing here, but like, look, this I, I can r- really wrap this gift really nice and mm-hmm. it's going to make this nice gift for, for someone and it's going to bring joy to someone. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't love having to do the cash register at the grocery store because it makes my feet hurt, but look, it's going to, I'm here because some mom is able to cook a meal for their kids this evening. You know, when you, when you see, see it from that perspective, I think it, we can see, find a little bit of joy in most mm-hmm. things that we do. Yeah. If there was something that you could tell the entire world on a billboard or on something, maybe perhaps one that would be mission related and then one that is, you know, something totally different, what might that be? That the minimalist home is available online and in bookstores everywhere. Is that is that kind of what <laughs> that counts? <laughs> that counts. Yeah. Uh, How many languages is that one? In? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Honestly, I would I would do that. But um, if I couldn't do that, I would I would I would say this like this that life is finite. That your life is your life is short. That we we all have limited money and limited time and limited resources and limited days and limited energy and maybe some have more money than others and some have more time than others and some have more abilities than others but the reality is that for every single one of us it's it's a finite um, set and what you choose to put into that one life may be the the most important thing about you Um, which is I think is what makes me so passionate about minimalism that it's about not wasting money and time on things that don't matter, but um, filling your life with things that do. I have a Chrome extension that tells me how many Sundays I have left in my life oh, that's good. based on the average lifespan, 2,423 that's good. Sundays left. Amy finds it anxiety inducing, <laughs> but I kind of like it. Um, Ernest Becker is a philosopher, and uh, he says that we are uh, we are all motivated um, by the fact of death. That it um, determines many of the actions that we take. As this reality that we all know that we're going to die, uh, it, it tends to influence many of the decisions that we make. Yeah. I remember the first time I had an existential crisis around the age of seven, realizing that I was going to die at some point and being terrified. (laughs) Increasingly, I'm learning to use it as something that motivates me. Yes, perfect. But it's tough sometimes. Yeah. Just feeling all of this, you know. So maybe my billboard would spur too many crisis moments in (laughs) seven-year-olds. Maybe I need to change... We'll no, go back to the minimalist home as a bit. I don't know. Okay, we'll just stick with that one. That. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, what, Joshua, what are you looking forward to these days? Uh, what am I looking forward to? Um, I am looking forward to a uh, new season of life. Um, the, uh, the book I have been working on for 
two years uh, writing it and uh, getting ready to release it and um, conversations like this, which will continue to go on. Two years of pretty focused work um, on the book. Uh, and, uh, and it's done and it's out. And I don't know for sure what is next. So I'm looking forward to having the opportunity to, to decide. It's an exciting time to have those openings. Yes, indeed. Well, I think it's time to answer a question from the jar, which we've conveniently brought. It would have been a shame had we left that at home. Now I have the jar. Uh, are the hard questions at the top? And I need to like dig to the bottom. So all you need to do is uh, choose one, whatever you'd like. Funny story about the jar is that it used to be blue, light blue, cream, and yellow. And we had to pull all of the yellow and cream cards and rewrite all of them on blue cards because no one would ever choose the cream or yellow cards. Really? Yeah. Don't. What is your favorite Prince song by uh, Gigi? I immediately knew who that, <laughs> that was going to be. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, I would say uh, Purple Rain is, the, uh, is my favorite Prince song. Have you, you seen the movie? Time? No. I haven't seen it in full. I'm probably a terrible Minnesotan for not having seen that, but... My wife loves Prince, and um, me not so much, but... Hey, that's fair. I thought these were going to be hard questions. You never... put a hard one on here. You're going to put a hard one. So we'll have you uh, put a question as well, but for anyone looking for the book, for you online, where is the best place for someone to find you online? www.becomingminimalist.com fantastic becoming minimalist.com yeah that's the home that's the headquarters for everything i'm everywhere facebook and twitter and youtube and amazon and books and all that but uh that tends to be the home base for everything i'm doing that's the hub well i'm honored to have had the chance to sit down with you and it's always a pleasure so thank you so much for for doing the podcast my pleasure thanks for sticking with us for if anyone made it through the whole podcast <laughs> very impressive very, very impressive, impressive. All right, and that concludes my conversation with Joshua. If you did enjoy the episode, please do take a moment to share it with a friend or leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It is super helpful in getting the word out about podcasts like this one, and it is greatly appreciated. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your week, and I'll see you soon.